on this Friday night. Charges laid in Kingston, Ontario. It is terrorism offences, so I think it's fair to say that it's a terrorism attack plot. What we know about the bomb-making plan and why refugee groups worry about a backlash. I will sign a bill to open our government for three weeks. After 35 days, U.S. lawmakers strike a deal to end the shutdown. So what about the wall that started it all? I am falsely accused of making false statements. And a crazy courthouse scene after new charges in the Mueller probe. Does it make collusion with Russia more likely? This is The National. The RCMP said it was a major national security investigation, but after last night's raid in Kingston, Ontario, they are offering few details other than the assurance that they acted in time. It was a, a confirmed attack plan. Um, there is motive, but I'm not prepared to comment on that right now. That's about all they'd say about the alleged plot. Police did confirm that one of the two people arrested last night faces terror-related charges and that the other was released without being charged. Our David Cochran picks up the details from there. A multi-force operation using dozens of officers, all fueled by a tip from U.S. law enforcement. We did receive credible FBI information regarding a, a, an attack plot. Uh, with no specific time, date, or location affixed to it. The attack plot, police say, was to build a bomb and then blow it up in a public place. The place and time were unclear, but the intentions were obvious. So after weeks of surveillance, police made their move. The individual was uh, reported to be involved in the manufacturing of homemade improvised explosive devices, and that was one of the subjects of our investigation. The individual is a teenage boy whose identity and personal details are protected by a publication ban because of his age. He made a brief court appearance this afternoon on terrorism charges. He will be back in court next week. The police made the arrest not because an attack was imminent, but because they felt they had enough evidence to block off streets and search houses. At no time was there a threat to public safety. The decision to arrest was made strictly on the collection of evidence and accumulating a substantial amount of evidence that allowed us to charge. Uh, no, no further need to, to pursue the investigation at that time. All of which raises a lot of questions about what happened with this man. 20-year-old Hussam Adin al-Zahabi was also taken into custody during Thursday's raids. Though the Syrian refugee was released Friday, without charge. Well, tonight, Hassam al-Zahabi is home. His father has maintained from the very beginning that his son did nothing wrong, and now they have been reunited as a family. And Ian, they're turning down all of our interview requests, at least for now. And David, we know, of course, that police spoke to the media today, but they also reached out to members of the Kingston community. And what was their message there? Yeah, the Al-Zahabi family is a Syrian refugee family. They came here two years ago after spending about a decade in Kuwait. They were sponsored in by a church group, and there are obvious concerns of a backlash when you have a Syrian refugee tied to a terrorist bomb plot. So the police have been reaching out to specific groups, to Muslim associations, to immigrant support groups, and Syrian refugee support groups, and they're offering them whatever reassurances and support they can to help them in the event of a backlash. Thank you, David. David Cochran reporting from Kingston tonight. So, David, touching on a possible backlash against the Muslim community. And these arrests have also renewed the debate about how Canada screens refugees. Defended today by the Prime Minister, challenged by the opposition. Katie Simpson is on that story tonight. As reports emerged that a 20-year-old man arrested in the Kingston terror raids came to Canada with his family as a Syrian refugee, Conservative leader Andrew Scheer issued a statement saying Canada's refugee screening process needs to be seriously examined. It's important to make sure that when we're bringing in people in a quick manner as we are, that they have the appropriate security checks and that everyone is completely safe and that security is utmost of concern. But the conservative demand for an examination came hours before police released that same 20-year-old man without charge. 
I think it's wiser in these circumstances, rather than uh, um, leaping to conclusions, let the police do their job, let's get the facts on the table, uh, and then we'll determine the appropriate course of action. What do you say when the public safety minister says uh, it's too early to come to that conclusion? I think it's fair. However, the minister also has to acknowledge that there have been lapses. The Conservatives have long been critical of Liberal immigration policy, especially after thousands of asylum seekers crossed into Canada on foot at the Quebec border. The Prime Minister has tried to neutralize this kind of criticism by questioning the Conservatives' motives. That is one of the things that, yet again, we're going to be talking about in this upcoming election because there are people uh, trying to create fears around the country, around immigration. This leader in Kingston's Muslim community does not want to see this specific case politicized out of fear of a backlash. We have to be very careful not to burden the rest of the community because of the uh, actions, bad actions of one of them. So I have, we have to be very careful not to exploit this in order to make a political point. Security experts are hesitant to weigh in on this case until more details are made available. Generally, though, it is not uncommon for radicalization to occur in Canada rather than abroad. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. Two big political stories were unfolding in Washington today. Government workers will soon be back at work, but maybe not for long. And, Andrew, a significant development in the Russia investigation. Yeah, so let's start there. Uh, the probe is looking into possible ties between the Trump campaign and Russian interference in the 2016 election. Today, it zeroed in on a longtime political operative. FBI, open the door. FBI agents arrested Roger Stone in a raid at dawn. It was ordered by special counsel Robert Mueller. Now, Stone is a close personal friend of the president. He's also facing seven charges, including obstruction, witness tampering, and making false statements. Now, his indictment alleges a direct link between Trump's senior loyalists and efforts to damage the Clinton campaign with hacked emails. It is a deep strike at the president's inner circle, but not one that's gone unanswered. Keith Bogue shows us. From the steps of the Fort Lauderdale courthouse, Roger Stone gave a defiant salute in the manner of his political hero, the disgraced president, Richard Nixon. The ensuing boos newly drowned out his declaration that he will fight the charges and win. Stone echoed what the president usually says whenever someone from his campaign team is indicted. The charges today relate in no way to Russian collusion, WikiLeaks collaboration, or any other illegal act in connection with the 2016 campaign. That is true. The specific charges don't relate to collusion, WikiLeaks, or the 2016 campaign. But the story told in the indictment definitely does. It says Stone lied about his efforts to get information from Julian Assange's WikiLeaks about emails stolen by Russian hackers from the Democratic National Committee and from the Hillary Clinton campaign. And it says Stone acted on behalf of Donald Trump's presidential campaign. One section of the indictment particularly stands out. It says that after WikiLeaks first released its stolen emails, a senior Trump campaign official was directed to contact Stone about any additional releases and what other damaging information WikiLeaks might have about the Clinton campaign. The way it's written seems deliberately to raise a question. Who had the authority to direct a senior campaign official? The answer would seem to be very few people, perhaps only Donald Trump, or someone in his family. Trump tweeted his familiar accusation that the special counsel investigation is the greatest witch hunt in the history of our country. No collusion. And he asked who alerted CNN to be there. That question arose from these CNN pictures at the moment the FBI arrived at Stone's house this morning. The official White House position remains. This has nothing to do with the president and certainly nothing to do with the White House. And Stone made sure to say that he still has the president's back. There is no circumstance whatsoever under which I will bear false witness against the president. That might be cold comfort to the president, Andrew. The indictment is supported by documentary evidence and indicates other sources of information that suggest the Mueller investigation might not even need Stone's testimony. 
And so, Keith, is the link between the Trump campaign, WikiLeaks, and Russian interference in the campaign, is that the collusion that Mueller's been looking for? Well, the indictment certainly indicates that the Trump campaign, through Roger Stone, was trying to reach out to WikiLeaks for information about emails stolen by the Russians in the hope of finding dirt on the Clinton campaign. So the indictment makes Stone an important link in what looks more like collusion today than it did yesterday. And add to that what we already knew about Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort sharing polling data with a Kremlin-connected Russian and what we might yet learn about the meeting at Trump Tower between Russians and the Trump campaign. Okay, Keith Bogue, thanks very much. Thanks, Evan. Roger Stone's indictment brings to 37 the number of indictments or findings of guilt connected to Robert Mueller's investigation. Many of those are for lying or finance crimes. Some are for meddling in the 2016 election. But when it comes to connecting the dots, most of the people fall into three general groups. Some were part of Trump's campaign. One had a personal relationship, and many are tied to Russia. In that first group, among those convicted, Paul Manafort and Michael Flynn, both high-profile advisors. Also pleading guilty, Michael Cohen, Donald Trump's longtime personal lawyer. And then there are the Russians, connected to the election, but not to Trump personally. 13 people indicted for election meddling and 12 military intelligence officers charged with hacking. So what many are waiting to see, how tightly Mueller will tie them to the other groups, if at all. Now, the Stone indictment was not the only stress test for the president today. Far from it. He's been under mounting pressure to end the government shutdown. And today, he backed down. For now. I will make sure that all employees receive their back pay very quickly or as soon as possible. It'll happen fast. Can't come soon enough, I'm sure, for those thousands of federal workers who missed two paychecks over the past five weeks. Plus, the deal is a temporary one. It's only going to provide enough funding for the next three weeks. So, after a 35-day standoff, what did either side get out of it? What was the point? That's well, a tough question. Here's Kim Brunhuber. I am very proud to announce today that we have reached a deal to end the shutdown and reopen the federal government. There are synonyms, of course, other ways of saying it, but it's hard not to see this announcement as essentially President Trump caving. After the longest shutdown in history, Trump reopened the government without getting a penny for the wall he so desperately wants to build. We really have no choice but to build a powerful wall or steel barrier. The shutdown has stretched for more than a month. 35 days without pay for hundreds of thousands of federal workers. Many, like these TSA agents in Newport Beach, California, resorting to food banks to make ends meet. We can't really do anything about it besides just hang on and wait for our paycheck to come in. Several of you are asking about connecting flights. Um, this is an issue due to a ground stop here in LaGuardia due to the government shutdown. Today, there were significant delays at some airports because of a shortage of air traffic controllers. The growing chaos no doubt played some role in today's announcement, but this deal to reopen the government while both sides try to discuss funding for more border security is what Democrats and even some Republicans had proposed before the shutdown even began. Democrats say they hope the president learned his lesson. Ultimately, this agreement endorses our position. It reopens the government without preconditions, gives Democrats and Republicans an opportunity to discuss border security without holding hundreds of thousands of American workers hostage. If we don't get a fair deal from Congress... The two parties have three weeks to strike a deal. If they don't, Trump is threatening to declare a state of emergency or perhaps order yet another government shutdown. With many still wondering, what exactly this shutdown was all for. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Newport Beach, California. And after all that, there's still the question of the State of the Union address, still up in the air. We know it won't happen this coming Tuesday. The Democrats won't allow it. But House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Donald Trump are expected to come up with a new date together. Her comments may not strike you as provocative, but some people in Britain are wondering whether the Queen crossed the line. In a speech, Her Majesty suggested people treat each other with respect. 
Her remarks are being seen as an attempt to ease tensions over Brexit. Thomas Dagler explains why that is controversial. The Queen arrived to deliver a low-key speech away from the cameras at a women's institute. But the message was heard right across Britain. She urged people with opposing views to come together, seek out the common ground, never losing sight of the bigger picture. The Queen didn't utter the word Brexit, but in a country this divided, that's what everyone heard, a plea for the warring factions to reach a truce. If you look at the words themselves, they're pretty kind of generic uh, sentiments, something you'd find on the back of a greetings card. This politics watcher says Elizabeth is not taking sides, but... The, the political culture has become very toxic in, in the UK. Um, and it may be that the Queen felt that it was time for her to, to make a rare intervention. The Queen doesn't weigh in on politics, at least officially, but maybe she's been dropping hints for a while. It's just hard to nail down what her message really is. Check out the hat she wore during a speech in the British Parliament. Sure looks like an EU flag. Through this state visit, Last fall, with the Dutch royals, she spoke of a post-Brexit relationship. As we look toward a new partnership with Europe. This tabloid even claimed the Queen backed Brexit years ago, though that headline was ruled misleading. Sometimes she can be less subtle, overheard saying before Scotland's independence referendum that voters should think carefully about the future. In her Christmas message a month ago, another plea, perhaps even about Brexit. Even with the most deeply held differences, treating the other person with respect and as a fellow human being is always a good first step. It's all about getting along, really. Hardly controversial, except at such a tense time. Thomas Dagle, CBC News, London. British MPs will vote next Tuesday on Prime Minister Theresa May's revised Brexit deal. If they reject it, there is an increased risk that Britain will crash out of the European Union. Here's some of the other stories we are watching tonight. The cleanup underway after a powerful rainstorm overnight caused flash flooding around Sussex, New Brunswick. Heavy rain lifted the Kennebecasis River beyond its banks and onto the streets and into buildings early this morning. About a dozen people were evacuated from their homes. Pumps and other equipment have been brought in to push the water out. The flooding also caused damage to roads, which government crews are working to repair. The cleanup is expected to take weeks. More than 100 people from Cape Breton protested what they say is the dire state of health care on the island. They showed up at the office of their provincial representative, Jeff McClellan. They say they're concerned about doctor shortages and the impending closure of two community hospitals. I saw crowded hospital rooms. I saw crowded hallways. I saw doctors run off their feet. McClellan told the group the Nova Scotia government's plan is to spend half a billion dollars to upgrade and expand two other hospitals. It hopes that will attract new doctors to the province. And an update to a story we told you earlier this week, power is being restored to a Toronto apartment building. About a thousand residents have been in the dark and in the cold since Tuesday when a pipe burst in the building's electrical room. Power is expected to be restored to the whole building over the next 48 hours. No word yet on what caused the pipe to break. And ahead tonight on The National, it's a real-life horror story about the murder of a little boy. But that boy's mother is disgusted by the film's Oscar nomination. We go in-depth and ask, whose story is it to tell? First, though, why are Canadian pediatricians changing their advice when it comes to exposing children to allergens like peanuts? And a little later, he's protected world leaders, helped catch criminals, but today is retirement day. It really is a big deal for us in the department, and certainly for him, to, to see him go off to be just a dog now, so it's nice.
More than two and a half million Canadians suffer from food allergies. The advice used to be that parents should avoid feeding children common allergens like eggs, nuts and cow's milk until the kids were older. But that's changed in recent years. Now they're being told to introduce those foods way earlier. But it seems not everyone is getting that message. So, as Nicole Ireland explains, the Canadian Pediatric Society is stepping in. I think you might need a bit more liquid. Cooking at home is one way Jothi Palmer can control what her kids eat. They have severe food allergies. When they were babies, doctors gave her advice to try to prevent that from happening. We were told to avoid all the common allergens until they were two or three years old. But years later, the Canadian Pediatric Society is urging parents to do the exact opposite and start feeding their babies food like peanut butter or eggs when they're between four and six months old, even if they have a sibling with a food allergy. The goal really of this practice point is to give the best evidence that we have to families, in particular families of children at higher risk, to allow them to live the best chance of an allergy-free life. So what's changed in the years since Jothi Palmer's kids were born and now? In short, better understanding of the science of food allergies. Back in 2015, a UK study that followed more than 600 children found an 80% reduction in the risk of developing an allergy among those who were exposed to peanuts as babies compared to those who weren't. We thought that you became allergic through your gut. So the thought at the time was, stay away from these foods, let the gut mature. The big change in our specialty has been, we now think you become allergic through your skin. And so the theory now is, if you eat these food, foods, your gut's actually teaching your body not to react. But such an about face in thinking can take time for family doctors and pediatricians to adopt and pass along to their patients. I think there are parents out there that have uh, that are confused in terms of some of the recommendations um, based on what they've heard from their primary care physician. The Canadian Pediatric Society hopes to clear up that confusion with this advice. Introduce your baby to foods such as nuts or eggs after they've started eating other solid foods. If there are signs of an allergic reaction, such as a rash, see a doctor. If there's no allergic reaction, keep giving your baby those foods regularly so they maintain a tolerance. And there is an exception. If babies have serious eczema, get medical advice before introducing them to potential allergens. If the current knowledge had existed a decade ago, Jothi Palmer would have given her babies nuts and other foods. If I, you know, could actually turn back time, I wish I could. To try to prevent the allergies they suffer from now. Thank you very Nicole much. Ireland, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, up next on The National. It was an invitation with the promise of luxury, but what they got was anything but. With two new documentaries just out, we ask, what is our fascination with the dumpster fire that was the fire festival? And a little later, why are women who compose music for films still such a rarity? I've experienced also um, some just sort of blatant sexism stuff as well, where, you know, people want to have a meeting to talk about their film. And then halfway through the lunch, you realize that, oh, wait, this was actually a date. Here's what we know about Oscar nominations. There will be outrage. And this year, it's over the nomination of the short film, Detainment. It's the true story of the murder of a toddler by a pair of preteen boys. The toddler's mother had no idea the movie was even happening, and she wants its nomination revoked. You know, usually Oscar outrage is political, uh, but this time it's really about who has the right to tell a story in the first place. I'm Stephen Marsh, random Toronto writer. I'm Stacey Lee Kong, a freelance writer. I'm Donovan Bennett, host and staff writer for Sportsnet. Art imitates life, so it's inevitable that real-life tragedies will seep into our entertainment. But you have to be fair to the people whose stories you're telling. What do creative types owe to the sources of their stories, especially when those sources are real people? If you want to tell other people's stories, you're going to have to betray them. That's inevitable. And you know, you can have art or you can have virtue, but in this world, you can't have both. Okay, so th this is not a film that you likely would have seen in, in theaters. It's a short film, 30 minutes, and you really 
have to just see it for yourself to understand why it's really set people off. So we're going to show you a clip, and then we're going to talk about how this is actually a much bigger conversation, well beyond just this one movie. Have a look. I know the truth. I believe I know the truth. So do I. I was there. That's right. You went. You see, Robert says that he was with you, and that you were indeed in Boothal New Strand together. <laughs> we wasn't. Robert says you were. Yeah, we was, but we never saw any kids then. We never loved any kids. So you were in Boothal New Strand. Was you in Boothal Strand? Yeah, we never got a kid, but we never, we never got a kid. So, look, there, there are really powerful, even frightening performances in this movie, and it's not just about detainment, right? This is the thing, but rather about countless films and creative works that use real-life horror to tell a story. I mean, think of any war movie that you've ever seen. They necessarily take real-life human suffering and then profit from it. So is it art or is it appropriation? Taking what's not yours and, and then using it. That, Stephen, what do you think? I mean, that is what art is. It is taking stories that are not yours and making them your own. And there's absolutely no way to escape it. Um, well, the, the only way to escape it is to essentially make PR, where you tell the stories that people want to have told about them. And anyone who doesn't do that, any journalist, any artist, anyone who actually tries to find the truth or, or, or find insight into real human dramas um, is inevitably going to tell stories that some people don't like. Some people who were part of those stories don't like. But, it, but isn't the big gripe here kind of on, on that line, right? Mm -hmm. that, that it doesn't have to be so black and white. I mean, you, you can be compassionate to no, the victims. You can't. I mean, to the, if, to you, if you're going to make good art, you have to be very cruel about getting to the reality. Because if, if you try and, and take everyone's feelings into account, you know, people have very different attitudes to their own stories than the reality of their stories. That's just part of the human condition. But, but I mean, the family wasn't even consulted, right? I mean, they, were, they were sort of blindsided by all of this. So the, the treatment of the film is one thing, but ought the director have, have said, look, I'm making this film? Yeah, he, he should have. For me, this conversation, your perspective is, I consider myself a citizen that happens to make content. Right. So my inclination is to have empathy for the people who it affects. But if you consider yourself as a content maker who happens to uh, be a citizen, then your loyalty is really in the storytelling. And I think yeah. to your point that they're, they aren't mutually exclusive. To tell the best story, I think you need to not only give a heads up, but also talk to the people who it impacted so you have their perspectives. You don't have to use it, but I think you need to have it as part of the conversation. But, 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 okay, so here's the follow through though to your point, because if you approach the family, if the director did that and said, look, I'm making this film, here's how I want to do it, and they say no, then what do you do? What do you do? So I see both of your points, because I do think there's a, an argument to be made for the value of this film, or that there, there is an argument somewhere. But I do fall on the side of compassion. I feel like if you're going to, talk about a, a family whose child was killed in a horrific way. You know, I think you can expect distance from an audience, maybe. You can look at them and, and the audience can say, oh yeah, you know, I can say there's a value to this film. But I don't know I can expect a mother whose child was tortured and murdered to have that same distance. And I think... So we should stop reporting on murder? No. Because no one, no victim, no, no victim of murder wants reporters around their door trying to figure out what happened. Like, no, no, no time anyone... That's not true. That's not true. It is almost always true. I mean, you can talk to reporters. They go and knock on doors to people who do not want to talk to them to get but to the, the point truth is they knock on the door. Yeah, right? they ask. The, the time for the director to say, and they my get, compassion what, to the so family when the door gets was not when he was on the red carpet, fun. is when this project was greenlit. And, and, and I, let's make the distinction, though, that, that, I mean, there's a difference between journalism and, and news stories and reporting and, and what this is, right? This is, which even, is a film. this is even much less invasive than any form of real journalism, like, which is always invasive, right? Like, and, and certainly novel writing fiction is always invasive of people's motivations and, and of their spiritual condition. But this is just literally court transcripts. Right? I mean, it is literally the performance of things on the public record. But that's okay. even more reason why you should talk to the families, because right. you can't derive enough about anyone than just by reading their text. Okay, uh, Stacey, okay, but even... I, 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 right. well, guys, I have a thought. I, I, I wanna, Stacey, I want to go to you, but first, I, I do want to let the director speak for himself. So, obviously, we know that there's a lot of support for the family of the victims in this case. There's an online petition with, uh, with 160,000-plus signatures. 
against the film, against the fact that it was nominated for an Oscar. So here's the director of the film uh, defending the decision not to notify the family, speaking with Irish media. Have a listen. You know, in hindsight, you know, I think we probably should have got in touch or just let her know that we were going to make it. But first of all, like, we never imagined the film was going to get this level of attention when we were setting out to make it. But, but also, there's, you know, there's more than one perspective on the case. And we wanted to make a film that was impartial and focused, you know, solely on the factual material, which has been public knowledge for 25 years. Stacey, do you buy that? That, that? that this is based on factual material in the public domain? No, for so many reasons. So first of all, I understand that in North America, this for, we were all aware of this case, but it didn't have the same, it didn't become the same cultural touch point that it was in the UK. And, and what is it that you find then most contentious about the film, but maybe also the way the material is treated? Be so here's what's funny is that I don't actually, I, I see an argument for making the film. So I obviously went down the rabbit hole of Googling this entire case and I realized or read a lot of the media coverage and the way that these boys were portrayed and they weren't portrayed like human beings. So I can see his argument for why he might want to explore the subject matter. And what is the consequence of, of that, of, of, I mean, almost looking at these boys as, as human? Right, and we're talking these yeah, ten-year-old. Yeah, absolutely. Killers. And in the clip, that was a that was a kid. You know, he was little. He he was crying. He was a ten-year-old. He was not some like foreign thing that we couldn't understand. So I I get the parents and the mother saying, I don't want them humanized. I think if you're asking about the value of humanizing them, we need to grapple with that as a society. That there are people who can go wrong. Well, to humanize people requires. Inspe you know, it requires inspection. It requires, Absolutely. which requires some people not to like your perspective. Absolutely. I mean, that, that is just the way, this, that's just reality. When you are looking at people's lives and then taking a perspective on them, you are necessarily controlling a narrative. Stephen, I don't know if yeah. I want to live in that society, my friend, because it's a slippery slope. Because then you could say, well, w the paparazzi should follow people and they get in car accidents, right? Like, where do you draw that line? I that's think there it. has to be a place where we say, I'm not comfortable at covering this for, for my gain, no matter what you think as a subject. Well, then okay, the alternative is just the people with power it, just don't get their stories told. And that, that's a horrible world. I mean, like, we, the, the question is here, do we want the stories or do we not want the stories? And I, I want the stories. I want to move on, <laughs> if we could. I, I have a feeling yeah. that we could talk about this for, for hours, not, right. not just minutes or dozens of minutes. Uh, but this is uh, another subject that got a lot of people talking, a documentary about a festival that was billed as this sort of luxurious uh, experience that ended up being a complete gong show. Uh, this is from Netflix, have a look. We were working around the clock, no sleep. Billy's like, bring more workers, we need more workers. Every single day, guys, more tense. He just would not take no for an answer. And he just kept pulling money in somehow. Desperate people do desperate things. He was lying to investors and making it seem like we were making a ton of money when we weren't. I mean, that's fraud. So there you have it. So, so Fire Festival, this was a, a major story, made headlines. It was, predominantly, it was in 2017, right, that, that, that this all went down. And it was uh, an event that was driven almost entirely by this celebrity social media campaign. Lots of people bought into it. Many expensive tickets were sold. It ended up severely under-delivering. Uh, there were criminal charges, as, as you just heard. Donovan, we see train wrecks all the time. What was it about this one in your mind that made it stand out? It was Instagram on an island. And, and I say that to say that uh, Instagram is not your real life. It's the highlight reel of your life. And this was promoted on Instagram uh, as being one thing, but ultimately it wasn't. And it shows our culture now. We've come to a place where everyone is really engaged and no one is really informed. Mm -hmm. And whether it was the party goers or the party planners, they cared about engagement and not informing themselves on what they actually got into. So they were literally sold something that was fake, that started fake on, on social media, and they ended up uh, buying into that tile on social media, and it brought it down on social media when we saw a cheese sandwich on social media, and we realized that all the beautiful pictures that they saw, Bella Hadid and pigs swimming <laughs> in the ocean, all that was not real, it was fake. Uh, so that's why I find the entire thing fascinating. And, and do any of you have, have sympathy 
for the people who bought into it. I mean, uh, on some know. level, I mean, the marketing was would have been. I have a convincing. little bit of sympathy. <laughs> I have a little bit of sympathy. <laughs> yeah. But okay, they were targeting people who weren't necessarily primed to be thinking critically, right? Like, where they're targeting young, wealthy people. So. Too now much money, I have. No, no, I know. No, no. <laughs> That's like she was well, really like, wow. I actually said those words, and I was like, oh, I, I might have to dial this back. But like, okay, if you have more money than sense, ninety-nine percent of me is like, no, you deserve what you got. But there is one percent of me that is imagining walking up to those janky like FEMA tents that were soaked because it had rained the night before, and being like, oh, that that does that's terrible. If a millionaire gets mugged, it's still awful. Like, it's not, like, I, I don't really feel, like, they're all going to be fine. Like, it's not Yemen. Like, you know, like, you know, like, the, like they're a real thing. But what I really wonder about is why it was so satisfying to watch, why it was so deeply satisfying because to watch all of this blow up in people's face. Because you're like, sadistic, Well, Stephen, is it, like, pers speaking of personal <laughs> well, cruelty, is it, like, just, like, is it just, like, or is it just, is it also that, like, we all operate on social media in this fraud that we're con and, and just to actually see it crumble as a real thing was was just so satisfying. It's truly a must see. That is the note on which we will have to end. Uh, we're just barely scratching the surface. I'm sure. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. I was intrigued by Stephen's view of humanity. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Straight ahead on the National, take a look at this year's. Oscar nominees for Best Original Score. All five are men. Eli Glasner looks at why next. There's kind of, of a feeling of not being taken seriously. Like, oh, how did, how did she get into this meeting and why is she here? But first, I want you to meet Connor Crisp. He seemed to have a promising future on the ice, a forward in the American Hockey League, a third round draft pick for the Habs, but then he was sidelined by concussions. In a documentary on Sunday, right here on The National, he shares his emotional journey and the difficult decision he was forced to make to retire young. Some days I'll feel super excited, super positive, and then out of nowhere, the snap of a finger, I could just be in a bad mood. And I never used to be like that. Definitely mood swings. like a long lineup at Tim Hortons. Like we'd be having a great morning and all of a sudden he was just pissed. It's for anxiety, for anxiousness. I can't imagine how hard it was for him to have to, you know, hang up his skates and, you know, make that like public announcement about retiring and, cause he's so young. Here are some of the other stories we're watching tonight. Two British Columbia residents accused in connection to the murder of a relative made their first court appearance in India following extradition from Canada earlier this week. Escorted by police, the mother and uncle of Jaswinder Sidhu arrived at the courthouse, their faces covered. Both are charged with conspiracy to commit murder. It's in connection to the young woman's death in 2000 after she rejected an arranged marriage. Instead, she married a rickshaw driver. Three people are already serving sentences for Sidhu's murder. At least seven people are dead and some 200 are missing after a mining dam collapsed in Brazil's southeast. A mass rescue effort is underway to pull survivors out by helicopter. Debris and mud flow was sent rushing into nearby communities, sweeping away buildings and vehicles and covering roads. The mine is owned by Brazil's largest mining company, Valley. The U.S. is trying to drum up international support for Venezuela's opposition leader, Juan Guaido. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is expected to urge members of the U.N. Security Council to recognize him as Venezuela's legitimate head of state. This all comes as Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro ordered U.S. Embassy staff to leave Venezuela. Canada has also declared support for Guaido. Well, this week's Oscar nominations had some bright spots for Canadians, but women were shut out in many categories, including music. Now, in the original score category, every single nominee was male, but that's no surprise when you look at the overall industry. Now, get this, of the composers credited in the top live action films over the past two years, just seven out of 301 were women. Hard to turn that around.
but female composers are starting to be heard, in part because they're making it happen. Eli Glasner explains. <laughs> Ask composer Janelle Bechtold who influenced her, and she goes right to the source, John Williams, the man responsible for the soaring scores of Star Wars, Superman, and so much more. Asked about one of her favorite female composers. Shirley Walker, definitely iconic. This is Walker's stirring theme from the animated Superman series, but while the men she worked with went on to Oscar acclaim, her name is nowhere near as well known. There's a lot of women who maybe don't work on the big studio films mm -hmm. um, just because they're not given the opportunity. Just take a look at last year. Of the top 250 films, only 6% hired women. Now, when I listen to music, I don't hear a gender. I just hear music. What, what is preventing women from getting those opportunities? There's just a, an unconscious bias. Mm. I mean, for hundreds of years, when you think of, of all the great classical composers, who do you think of? Right. Bach, Beethoven, Mozart. A lot of dudes. <laughs> Narrow the focus to Canada, and the picture doesn't improve. A recent study from the Screen Composers Guild of Canada found women here earned eight times less than men, while men were twice as likely to be hired full time. And more than half of the women who participated in this study reported dealing with sexism and harassment. Beckfold says often it's men who either don't think she can handle the technical requirements or... I've experienced also um, some just sort of blatant sexism stuff as well where, you know, people want to have a meeting to talk about their film. And then halfway through the lunch you realize that, oh, wait, this was actually a date. <laughs> so women are helping themselves. This is a celebration organized by the Alliance of Women Film Composers. The president was disappointed by the Oscar nominations, but not surprised. It's not just a glass ceiling, it's kind of a cement ceiling. She says much of the problem is the mostly male decision makers, producers, directors, and agents. There's kind of, of a feeling of not being taken seriously. Like, oh, how did, how did she get into this meeting and why is she here? It's almost felt with a little bit of a sneer and it, it, it's, it's a boys club. So the Alliance is creating their own club to support new voices. Hello, come on in. <laughs> Canadian Carly Parody is one of those. In her London, England studio, she sketches out the sounds that accompany new shows on Netflix. Recently I was on a BBC panel for a music festival and there's a lot of females coming up to me to ask questions after. But 10 to 15 years ago when I used to go to those conferences, I'd be the only female there. And while the Oscars overlooked women this time, Parody says some coming attractions could change things. Look at 2019, we've got two female composers working on um, big comic films, um, uh, Joker and Captain Marvel. And I think that's a really exciting thing. I just, th I think it, it'll take time. Parody says having women composing for two of this year's most anticipated films sends a powerful message. I'm not what you think I am. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. The moment is up next, and tonight it's a retirement party at the Halifax Regional Police Force. The relationship that we have is a, is a bit of a marriage of sorts, so it's been good. It's been nice to be a part of his, his career from the beginning to the, to the very end. He's helped apprehend 200 suspects and protected the likes of Prime Minister Trudeau, President Bush and members of the royal family. But today was time for a very good boy to turn the page on an illustrious career. Steeler served with the Halifax Regional Police K-9 unit for eight years. So today alongside uh, with his partner, Constable Phil McDonald, he said goodbye to his colleagues on the force and chowed down on some cake. They reminisced about the job and looked forward to Steeler's next chapter. I don't think he reminisced. Just hanging out. This is our moment tonight. We go to work together. He works side by side and he comes home with me at night. Uh, so it, the relationship that we have is a, is a bit of a marriage of sorts. So it's been good. It's been nice to be a part of his, his career from the beginning to the, to the very end. He's probably been my most cerebral dog. Like he's very intelligent. 
He understands when things need to be turned on and turned off. When he's home, uh, that relationship changes uh, where he's allowed to be himself, just, just be a dog. So it's nice that that can be a full-time thing for him now, as well for me, because there's no, there's no real expectation that he's gonna remain uh, focused or on task. He can just, like I said, he can just be a dog. <laughs> you know, Andrew, it's been interesting for me as a reporter all these years to see how police forces have realized the appeal of dogs. And that story basically had certain members of our senior team, they pretty well were sold on the word dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. And, but, and when you think about it, 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 I mean, it must be so strange. It's such a weird feeling to think that your dog has a job, right? Like, that must be such a foreign feeling to most people. And weirder still, the idea that... that they're going to retire someday, but, but there you go. And, and it'll be interesting to see what, what life looks like after that. I don't even know. These are big questions, Andrew. We'll think about them during the weekend. <laughs> We've got some time. <laughs> That's the National for this uh, January, what are we, 25th? 25th, yeah. 25th. Good night. Good night. <laughs>